you know, Aspen, how we kind of fit into this, into this matrix, into this ecosystem ourselves is like, what, what we like to think we do best is we convene leaders, we identify breakthrough ideas, we package them up into frameworks and resources, we mobilize leaders around the most powerful of those ideas, right? We communicate them out to the media, help them give storylines, elevate the whole, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole sector, hopefully. But, you know, that wasn't, all this stuff wasn't in place in 2013, you know? And it was an important time to come together at the very first Project Play meeting in Aspen on a snowy day where almost nobody came because it was so socked in, all the, all the uh, flights to Aspen were, uh, were canceled. We had to bus people in from Denver. Weren't sure if anybody was going to show up. 80 people showed up. It was awesome. Um, but it was the right time to come together because there were sharply declining participation rates in sports. And nobody really quite noticed that. But from 2008 down to 2013, during the economic uh, recession, kids stopped playing sports in a significant kind of way. It was in part due to major funding cuts in, uh, in park and recs departments, right? There was also no public awareness that like, many kids actually lacked access to sport. I worked at ESPN at the time, and I would tell you know, people in the building there, hey, some kids can't play sports, and they look at me like I'm crazy. Like, everybody has a chance to play sports, right? Well, no. A lot of kids in Detroit and Buffalo and in Native American reservations and lots of other places were just like below average athletes didn't have access to sport at that time. And ESPN, to their credit, got hip to it, let me do a lot of journalism around that topic. Um, early sports specialization 10 years ago. That was seen as best practice. Remember like B Malcolm Gladwell's book, The 10,000 Hours Rule, which all these parents read and like, well, I better get my kid like hyped up on high doses of sports starting when they're three and four or five years old because the early bird gets the worm, right? Well, not really, uh, you know, and uh, you know, the, the stories about Tiger Woods and anecdotal success stories were kind of, they defined the narrative at the time. Um, there was no agreement uh, on how to attack these problems. There was no national youth sport policy. Nike was among the few companies actually investing in the space back then. Give it up for Nike, they're still there. <laughs> the first mover there. Uh, and there was no venue really to drive progress across this, dis uh, this joint disjointed landscape. And that's no longer the case. Today, Project Play is a network of more than 20,000 leaders across the eight sectors that touch the lives of children. Driving impact. Today, you are Project Play, and we, together, have gotten a lot done. You've helped us connect silos across the landscape of youth sports, raised awareness of participation gaps, shaped what good looks like in youth sports, helped communities take action, Sports, the sports industry, through the Project Play 2024 Roundtable, has mobilized to support. You've helped us reward organizations through the Project Play Champions Program, more than 100, uh, to align their programming with the Project Play uh, strategies. You've challenged parents to do better through the Don't Retire Kid campaign. We found the most innovative school sports programs in the country with your support. And then we, pa we took the best ideas, the best models, packaged them up for a playbook, for principals and school leaders uh, you know, to, to make sport more accessible to more kids in the school environment. We've obviously recognized that children actually have rights, rights in sports. And you have unlocked, shaped, and distributed more than $100 million in grants. Let's give it up for everybody. <laughs> Has the problem been solved? Not even close. This is a long game. We have a lot of work to do. Um, but your collective efforts, and you need to know this, have made a difference. You know, just prior to the pandemic, there was an uptick in the percentage of trained coaches in this country in key competencies in working with kids. Team sport participation, which was declining, flattened it out. And then in one year, it started to rise five points. More than 600,000 new kids playing in one year alone just before the pandemic. Oops. And then the percentage of physically inactive kids, meaning those who did nothing during the year, organized sport, casual, just going to the, just anything, like just getting those kids off the couch, that number fell every year to under 17%. So I want to give you a, you should, this is, everyone played a role in this happening. <laughs> then COVID hit, disrupted everything, right? And our most vulnerable youth were hit the hardest. 
In 2021, only one in three kids from low-income homes played sports. That's half the rate of kids at the uh, uh, opposite end of the uh, income, uh, imp income spectrum. And overall, that pulled sport participation rates down to 51%, right? So not good. Only half, only half kids play organized sports in this country. So where do we go from here? How about if we build a sports system or sports systems, because it's not just at the national level, it's at the local level too, that don't create these access and quality gaps in the first place. One in which parents have the knowledge to guide their child through the often Byzantine maze that is youth sports in this country. How about if we create in a, a system in which coaches are trained in the key competencies in working with, with kids? And local sport options are varied and they're high quality. And maybe most important, that kids have a voice in the design of the experiences. I'm telling you, this is all for the taking. This is not just Tom being, you know, glass half, you know, half, half full. I've been watching this space for a while. I've seen the incredible movement. I see how people are talking, they're moving, they're acting. And I think all of this is for the, take, for the taking, that we have laid this foundation. The question is, how do we get there? So I'm gonna pump a couple big ideas in the bloodstream because that's another thing we do within Project Play uh, is, is, is thought starters. So here are a few. Number one, can we recognize that we actually have a system of sports in this country? I know it seems like it's just so disjointed. The clubs don't talk to the schools and co you know, information about injuries is not being relayed. Uh, it, it, it can seem completely and totally chaotic. But here's the thing, having gone to all these different communities, we see the same cycle over and over again. Basically, kids get introduced to the same four or five team sports when they're four or five, six years old. Then the travel teams form, and we structurally begin to push aside the late bloomer, the kid from the lower income home, the kid who might just have like a bad birthday. They're you know, 11 months younger than some other seven-year-old, and so they're just cognitively behind, they're physically behind. Um, and maybe the kid who just hasn't really grown into their bodies, their minds, and their interests. And that is the fundamental flaw in our sports system. We're sorting the weak from the strong well before they grow into their bodies, minds, and interests. I've been saying this for 10 years. What I thought was interesting is when NPR interviewed me and then Jason Gay from, from the Wall Street Journal uh, grabbed the quote and put it out there, um, there was an incredible engagement, not like Kardashian-level engagement. <laughs> But like, the people were responding. I've never seen more uniformity of agreement on Twitter in this highly polarized country than around this comment. So this told me that people understand that we have a system, it is broken, and they want something better, right? So my question is, can we think about how all of these institutions uh, can work together more effectively at the city level? at the state level, huge opportunity there, untapped, and at the national level. Can clubs communicate more effectively with schools? And I would say the progress starts today in this room. When you leave, when you're uh, getting lunch, when you're at the museum tonight, stand, the person you're standing next to, sitting next to on the bus, ask them, hey, what do you do and how can we work together? How can I help you? Start to create that fabric at the local level, the state level, the national level, the sport level. We're, we're not so darn siloed, right? So here's the deal. I actually want to see if you guys agree with some of the ideas that I'm pumping into the bloodstream right here. And, uh, and I want to remember that Fowdy clap she just did, the, the boom, 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 uh? Thing? You remember that? Okay, so if you agree, if you think that we can stitch together institutions better at the local level, let's do this, ready? And you don't, you don't have to stand. We'll just do the clap, 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 and then uh, okay? All right, ready? If you agree. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm not as good as her. <laughs> Number two, can we empower the NGBs, right? The NGBs have been highly, the national governing bodies of sport have been highly scrutinized, obviously, in recent years. You know, gymnastics, swimming, et cetera, and deservedly so. But they're also key players in reshaping their sport. And many just need funding and accountability, of course. When there is funding, uh, they can do amazing things. The U.S. Tennis Association, one of the NGBs, gets uh, a good chunk of change. Yeah. 
USDA has been an amazing member of uh, Project Play really since inception as well, and the Project Play 2024 Roundtable. You know, they, uh, they put something in place called Net Generation a few years ago. Got, tel uh, got uh, 12,000 uh, schools, PE teachers trained in tennis. Well, is it surprising at all, and yes, the pandemic helped, but is it surprising at all that they've seen a 48% participation lift? Okay, all right. You can do some amazing things if you have resources. Hockey, USA Hockey, in 2009 had a participation problem, or more specifically, an attrition problem. Like kids were signed up and they're dropping out by you know nine and 10 years old. So they said, hmm, let's create the American development model, a concept of what needs to happen in each stage of development from zero to five, all the way through the teenage years. Practice to game ratios, what coaches are supposed to be trained in, what parents should be thinking about, and then we're gonna message it out to all of our key constituencies. And we're gonna back it with policy. They got rid of national championships at 12 and under. They banned body checking at, uh, at, at, uh, at 12 and under, the, the peewee level. And they began to see things turn back up again. Not an easy thing to do when you have ice. You know, just a limited amount of it in this country. Right? So the question I have, I'm, this is my big idea I want to put in the bloodstream here. Like, can we basically reward the NGBs? Because about, there are about 30 of them now that have an American Development Model Program for themselves, but it's just an educational resource, okay? How can we create incentives around that? Could we, say, give a score, maybe by a third party, to every one of the NGBs out there on how well you're doing in terms of age-appropriate play, training your coaches, diversifying your pipeline, uh, abuse prevention policies, et cetera, right? And then we give money to those that are doing it well. Now we've changed, we've gone from a, a model of money and medals to money and, money and participation and quality use for participation. So, and I can tell you the NGBs, I think, kind of want something like this. I don't want to speak for them, but we, we surveyed them prior to the summit here. And uh, we asked them, do you think you should be effectively, uh, be, be rewarded for effectively developing the grassroots? And if so, by who? And you can see, you can see the answers there, everything from government to the USOPC. So let me get a sense of like, whether there's some, there's some enthusiasm around exploring this idea. Ready? Three claps and then a ha, huh. right? <laughs> oh, you guys are good. You're teachable. Number three, scaling community solutions, okay? So Cambridge Youth Soccer is this group that I talk about a lot lately. It came to the summit last year. They, at a time when soccer participation has been fairly flat, they have tripled registrations in the past few years. How? No one silver bullet solution. But what they did do is they, uh, is they created a, a, a model in which the travel team kids could also play rec. So they found a league that travel was playing on Sundays and rec is on Saturdays. And they actually said, if you're gonna be part of our, our thing, you need to do both. And you know what, kids have totally responded to it. Families have responded to it. You know, wealthy families are donating all sorts of money to, so the kids who are you know, lower income in, 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 in Cambridge can afford this model. It is a disruptive and a positive way kind of model. Another example, like a community solution. I don't know where Julie McCleary is in the room here, but our people in Seattle. Uh, Julie, where are you? No, she's not gonna, she's gonna let me call her out, okay. All right, so we did a state of play report in Seattle. Something that came out of that with Julie's group is the Play Equity Coalition. And they've done amazing things. What they did just a couple weeks ago was lobby the state legislature to get recess made mandatory in all grade schools in the state of Washington. Right? This could uh, impact up to a million kids all the way through, you know, um, uh, really through 12th grade because there are some impacts beyond, uh, beyond grade school. So my question is, can we distill these models, these success stories into toolkits and promote them and create incentives around them? Here we go. Ready? Thank you. And do this at the sport level, the city level, through these coalitions. Number four, deploying the power of the permit. Okay. U Sports is a hardware software equation. The software of the programs, the hardware of the places that the programs get plugged into. Those are park and recs, those are school, there are schools, and then there are private facilities as well. So if you want good uh, quality programs in your, in your community, use the power of the permit. If you want access to these fields, to these gyms, 
Show us your coaches are trained. Show us you, their background checked. Show us that your programs are meeting the needs of all kids in that community, that you're not just you know, uh, uh, pulling from the top income tier, right? We can drive access, we can drive quality, we can sol solve all these problems by setting the conditions under which people use these taxpayer-funded uh, facilities. You know, LA Parks and Rec uh, is getting all of their, their, uh, their, their staff trained in, in key competencies in working with youth. Uh, Cincinnati Recreation Commission, success story there, they have said to the 28 or so organizations that are using their fields, they did this a, a decade ago, by the way, you know, if you want to use these fields, then you, you know, you have to get this type of training. A little bit of pushback at first, now everybody's on board with it, right? Terrific. Uh, disc so use these discounts, use preferred slots, you know, create these incentives and mandates to improve the quality of sports in the communities. Ready? Thanks. All right. Getting clear on the purpose of school-based sports. Look, today, the only college recruiting that's being done through high school sports isn't football. Maybe a couple of sports to a lesser degree. But, and I think that's okay. This is a little bit angst about it. I think that's perfectly fine. That should allow schools to really focus on not just the best athletes and what kind of downstream opportunities they might have in college or beyond that, but like serving the broadest swath of the student population. Whoops, could you go one slide, there you go. So we put, the, this is the model that we focus people on in our school, uh, Reimagining School Sports Report. There's the, there's the traditional model, which, you know, the school's at the center, you get your best athletes. We do interscholastic sports, we try and beat your people. Okay, that's good. Nothing wrong with that model. Totally fine with that model. But can we move to more of a student-centered student model in which there's interscholastic sports, but maybe bring back intramurals where appropriate. Maybe create community, uh, community partnerships. Maybe student-led clubs can meet the interests of students. Can we put the student at the center and say, what do you want, and then uh, build programming from there? Number six, lean into policy and government. Look, uh, and governance. Look, we, we don't like government uh, un until we need it, right? And we were reminded of this during COVID. Remember when everything shut down and people couldn't have their, their programs in place and they start calling the health department in the state of California or Texas or, well, Texas doesn't really shut down much, right? <laughs> I love Texas. But you know what I was saying, there, there was like this sort of this chaotic environment of like, how are we gonna deal with it? And the health department people like, well, we don't really know what the best practices are here. Um, and, and, and so it's, it's an inefficient kind of thing. And I think it's a reminder that, you know, there actually is a role for government, an appropriate, well-defined role for government uh, in terms of uh, uh, convening people, setting standards, um, and then driving systems change. Look, when we think about the big drivers of participation in over the past several uh, generations, it's been Title IX, federal le legislation that didn't cost an actual penny. Right? The American Disabilities Act. The Amateur Sports Act, which we're gonna talk a, talk a bit about tomorrow. And then the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which some of you may not even know about, that person does. <laughs> but the Land and Water Conservation Fund, it's matching funds using oil drilling money from the Gulf that have gotten more than 40,000 recreational facilities built in this country since the 1960s. And as of a year, two years ago, got fully funded for the first time ever. This stuff is important. It's really catalytic. Policy does matter. So my question is, can we develop good public policy around sports? And again, do this at the city level, the state level, and the national level. Ready? Thank you. You know, it's one reason why we ex are excited to have the, uh, the, the Olympic Reform Commission do a listening session tomorrow because they're going to uh, dig into the... Uh, the federal piece, or at least the USOPC and the NGB's piece of it, how can they be most uh, you know, productive in building healthy kids and communities through sports? Uh, number seven, make room for the pro league. So when Project Play got started 10, 10 years ago, they really weren't involved in youth sports at all. Now they're doing amazing things. The NFL has gone hard, thanks to Zell Reese, I don't know if he's here or not, but you know, had gone hard at the, uh, at the, at the flag issue, girls getting into flag, participation is going through the roof. Major League Baseball invested in play ball and casual play, 
went up significantly. The NBA, junior NBA leagues, the NHL, through their street hockey. This is all good. They're getting involved at the entry level. They're using their assets, their, their megaphone, uh, their brands to create new opportunities for kids who haven't had them previously. The MLS, uh, from a top-down level, has created academies uh, where they're getting the best players into these more coherent sport environments. Even signing kids as early as age 14 or 15, some people don't like that. I'm actually okay with it. I think it's fine. I think we need to basically have a better understanding as to what you know, practice, good practice to game ratios are, uh, have kids in coherent development structures. It can be a role modeling thing for other uh, leagues and uh, you know, folks working in the, in, the, in the teenager space. The key, the key in those kind of programs as well as any programs is honoring the rights of children. Do you have access to an education? Do you have a voice in the experience? Uh, are, you, you know, are you not being economically exploited? So um, that's, that's the key. You know, so let's, I would say let's, let's, let's make room for the pro leagues to engage at the local level. So you know, unlock that power. So what do you think? Thank you. I only got a couple more of those I'm going to get out of you. So. All right, leveraging mega events, okay? The 1984 uh, uh, Olympics uh, left a, a profound legacy. It's called the LA 84 Foundation. You know, I don't know what the grant making is up to now, but it's probably a 150, 200 million dollar uh, endowment that, that spits out grants and has served millions of children, including the Williams sisters, uh, over the past, uh, really since the 1984 Olympics. The 1994 World Cup created the U.S. Soccer Foundation, which is doing amazing work in building many pitches around the country. This is real and true legacy. And in the next few years, we have the 2026 World Cup coming. Okay, folks, this is going to be the biggest event in the history of sporting events. There are, it's going to be over like a month and a half um, all over the country. Um, and then two years after that, we have the 2028 Olympics and Paralympics, which is going to be a great storytelling opportunity, right? So the question I have is, what's fair to ask of mega events in terms of delivering legacy? Is it funding? Is it storytelling? Is it messaging? Is it sports sampling? Is it new partnerships, right? So who sees the opportunity in le leveraging mega s sporting events? Thank you. I'm going to start dancing in a moment. All right. Get close. Uh, setting national goals. This is something we've never done before in Project Like We recognize that like, there's plenty that we have out of our control, here, like a pandemic, like emigration trends, the economy, technology, et cetera, et cetera. We're humble in that respect, right? And I would also say that organized sports is not the only metric that counts. Casual play counts just as much, maybe even more. Skateboarding, we're going to have a whole panel on that tomorrow with Jeff Amen. Uh, Yoga, I've gotten into yoga lately, I love it. Um, climbing, you know, all the outdoor recreation sports, so I want to contextualize this. Another metric that matters are injury rates. You know, I have three kids, I got a panel tomorrow, you'll get to meet them all if you'd like to come. And we've had, we've had ups, we've had downs, we've had gains, we've had loss. And we've also had to struggle with three ACL injuries to two of my sons by the age of 18, right? And so how, and I would, a couple of them were entirely preventable. So like, how do we, how do we prioritize uh, you know, injury prevention in this process? But organized sports is what the people in this room, most people in this room, have the greatest amount of control over. So I want to ask you, what if we set our North Star of 63% of all kids playing sports by 2030? Ready? Okay. Um, finally, start with the end in mind, right? So I play, my, my thing is beach volleyball in San Clemente. And that's your MC right there in the, in the, in the red in the front there, in the red short, red pants. Uh, uh, Julie and I live in the same town. Um, and it is just awesome, you know? It is people from 18 to 78, half men, half women, come together, it's all positive. I get the emotional, the social, all the physical benefits, all the stuff we talk about in Project Play, we all do, we just love it. People come from, some people get their news from 
Fox News, others from MSNBC, but we're not trying to win political arguments. We're building community, we're developing relationships, we're seeing people as human beings. And none of that would have happened if this group of people, almost every one of them, wasn't exposed to PE, love of game, physical literacy at an early age. It allows us to basically act like kids, you know, at our more uh, advanced age. So um, uh, th uh, there's no illusions about the challenge. I have no, I'm under no illusions about the challenge of adjusting this model, but I think everybody in this no room knows that we can do better. And I'm optimistic. You know why? Because Americans rally around sports. Americans rally around our kids. I would say the path to 63% by 2030 starts here. So who's in? One last time. Thank you.